I'm Dr. Anthony Cave, an anesthesiologist and integrative medicine specialist. And every year in one of my local emergency rooms, a handful, maybe four or five young people in their 20s have a missed diagnosis of a stroke. This is absolutely mind boggling. And the standard story is something that's very important to understand because if you understand the story, you'll see who is at risk of having missed diagnoses and maybe being gaslit and not getting the diagnosis that they need for the care that they might need that might have a really bad consequence. It's usually a 20 or 30 year old young man or young woman who comes in high on something. Usually it's marijuana. I practice in the San Francisco Bay Area. There's a lot of weed being used. I'm not saying weed is good or bad. There's many medicinal uses for it that we're not going to talk about in this episode. But when someone comes in with dizziness, and they might be high on something, and maybe they're a little bit wobbly on their feet, and the doctor is like, well, it could be a stroke, it could be an infection, more likely than not, you come in high on some edibles or something, and that patient goes home. A day later, their symptoms get worse. Two days later, they might not be able to talk or walk, and their symptoms progress and get worse and worse, and sometimes you can't fix the problem, because once brain is dead, brain tissue can't regrow itself. What happened in this story and what can you take away from this so that you minimize your chances of not getting your diagnosis accurate and fast by doctors? I'm going to share a couple concrete tips. First and foremost, recognize that these are emergency room symptoms, though the rates of misdiagnoses, which by the way, are like one uh, about 5%, I should say, in the emergency room, similar to private pra- uh, primary care settings and inpatient care, 5%. Of those 5% missed diagnoses, only a minority are serious. And of those minorities, an even smaller minority actually are a serious event. So doctors overall in the United States do a very good job. It's something like 0.3% of missed diagnoses that actually lead to something harmful like what I'm sharing. But it happens and I want you to be empowered to advocate for yourself. I'm going to give you the questions that I want you to ponder and ask your doctor because we're talking about strokes specifically today because it affects so many people young and old. So in this story, it was a young person. This is important because young people are the most likely to have their diagnoses be deferred or delayed because young people are typically healthy. It's not only young people, old people are also at risk of having a missed diagnosis or being brushed off or gaslit because unfortunately in Western society, old people, and it pains me to say this, but unfortunately our culture does not glorify elderly people. They're put away in nursing homes, they're kind of put out of sight, out of mind, and you see that in all of the advertising that happens. Just look at the billboards when you're driving anywhere. They rarely show old people unless it's specifically an ad for a nursing home or a hospital. Youth is glorified in the West and old people are neglected. Who else is neglected in medicine? People of color and immigrants and overweight people. And this is unfortunate because these are the populations that often need the most medical diligence and care and compassion. Yet they're often the ones who are going to be gaslit statistically more likely than the average individual. So a young person coming in, we call them the worried well in medicine. Uh, coming in on some sort of intoxicant. Well, we all know that that's going to mess up your sensory system. It's going to be difficult to, for the doctor to truly understand your symptoms. And uh, dizziness. Dizziness is the hallmark of a vague symptom. And you need to know that the cases that are most missed in the emergency room setting, and this is going to hold in other settings as well, like in your doctor's office for primary care, are what? Atypical, transient, nonspecific, mild. These buzzwords are the strongest predictors of a missed diagnosis. It's not the person coming in with overt chest pain or they can't move their arm. Those ones, they're going to work up a stroke or a heart attack with the appropriate tests immediately. It's the ones that come in with atypical or abnormal or rare representative representative symptoms and young people especially. So what do you do if this is you? 
first and foremost, if you are under the influence of something, hopefully you have somebody with you to ask these questions, because if you're not able to ask these questions, well, of course it won't apply to you, but first and foremost, ask your doctor what is their plan. Their plan, doctors get paid to enact plans. That is my job day in, day out. I assess a patient, I come up with a plan. In the United States, it's what all doctors have to do to get paid. It's their job. So it's your right as a patient to ask your doctor, doc, what is your plan? What if my symptoms worsen? How does that change your plan? When should my symptoms get better? So for example, in the, case, in the patient who comes in high on a substance and dizzy, well, if they ask, what is your plan? Maybe the plan is to go home and wait for it to wear off. And if after 24 hours, your symptoms are not getting better or are getting worse, you come right back to the emergency room. Or after six hours, depends on whether you ate an edible, whether you smoked the weed, whatever it is, right? That's one example. Number two, always feel empowered to ask your doctor, what else might this be? Uh, Robert Lovigren from Sweden, thank you so much for that super thanks and a big th uh, hello back from the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and I see Psychic Alchemy is talking about EDS. You know, EDS absolutely falls in this category. We know that EDS is more common in particular demographics that I've already talked about. And I hope that these tips are also going to help you feel empowered to ask your doctor these questions so that other diagnoses are not missed in yourself. So what was I saying? What else might this be, doctor? Maybe it's because of when someone comes in with dizziness, we think maybe it's some stress-related phenomena, which often it is. In the average individual, if, they, if everything else is negative and they're healthy, but they've had a big recent stressor, an argument, a lost job, whatever, whatever, dizziness could, could be from that, but you have to make sure it's not other things first. Dizziness is a vague symptom. It actually makes doctors very uneasy because you don't know if it's from the brain, if it's from the heart, from the lungs, from a blood vessel, but you need to always ask your doctor, what else might this be? And specifically, if you want to know what are the things that can never be missed in an emergency room setting, otherwise bad things happen, you should know that they're related to the brain. We've obviously talked about strokes, infections like meningitis, uh, heart attacks can always lead to dizziness, arrhythmias, any worsening of congestive heart failure, for example, can lead to that. And you should also know that vessels and vascular problems, blood clots, ripped vessels, what we call dissections or tears, these are things that can have very vague symptoms. And it's not a surprise that these are among the most misdiagnoses that lead to a bad outcome. And it's in young people in particular that you don't think they're gonna have these problems. So always feel comfortable asking your doctor, what else could it be? Could it be one of those things related to your heart, your brain, a blood vessel, et cetera? And you, the number three, you need to be comfortable telling your doctor, I'm not comfortable with this plan. When you're honest with your doctor, you will get them to pause because doctors aren't used to, to patients speaking up like that. It's not about being rude to doctors, and doctors want to help. Don't think that doctors are trying to blow you off in most cases. There's always going to be some weirdos out there, just like in any profession. But in my experience, the vast majority is when patients um, see overwhelmed doctors and something is not being communicated properly. So if you can improve the communication from your end and expect the same from them, you're going to minimize the risk of valuable information not making it through. And your honesty is one of the best ways to facilitate that communication. Uh, Stephen Rapp, thank you so much for that super thanks. Uh, encouragement to write a book on doctor-patient communication. Gosh, well, I wonder if others think that as well. Maybe, maybe that'll be one of my next projects. Thank you again, Stephen. I'm not comfortable with this plan. I am anxious, doctor, with this plan that's being communicated to me. And number four, being objective. I know my body, doctor, this is not normal for me. Maybe you have a diary where you put your pain on there every single day and this is clearly different. Or there's been a trend that has 
been concerning. Maybe you can see that, oh, the foods I'm eating, like I haven't been able to eat food. My weight has changed because of the pain, because maybe I can't swallow, whatever it is. Maybe if you have dizziness at baseline, if you can objectively in a diary put what your scores are, this is something your doctor can better understand that this is not normal for you. At the end of the day, every patient's gonna know more about their body than a doctor will. A doctor's job is to help elucidate and empower the patient to find the right healing plan. Alexis, thank you so much for that super thanks. It's very, very kind of you. And Susan, Deborah, uh, you're all very kind as well with, uh, with those positive words. Uh, MW, I appreciate that as well. So the last thing is over explaining. When communication, especially in an emergency-like setting, so we're talking about stroke today, we'll talk about other misdiagnoses later on, but stroke is one where seconds count. We have a saying in medicine, time is brain. When time is spent over explaining, this can dilute what needs to happen in a fast, efficient timetable. It's not about feeling ashamed to share things, but there needs to be trust between the patient and the doctor that the doctor is listening to the patient. And sometimes patients give me a lot of information about what their cat ate last year. And if time is of the essence, that's, that may not be appropriate. I'm not blaming the patient, but this is where your honesty is going to help make sure that this communication is not feeling threatened, like a doctor saying, or a doctor cutting off patients, which happens all the time. I see it in my colleagues. Breaks my heart, but it happens. I believe that if patients can trust their doctors, that the doctors are asking the important questions quickly, that we can avoid the stigma of feeling bad because someone's being cut off, but rather maybe a patient saying, doctor, I felt that was important to share. If you don't feel it's important, please tell me why. Because what happens when I've seen my fellow doctors cut patients off, patients get really silent. So now you've gone from over explaining to under explaining. And what happens if you don't communicate with your doctor? Misdiagnosis. You can't afford to have a misdiagnosis, especially when we're talking about the brain, the heart, the lungs, blood vessels, infections, etc. These are the things that are missed in young people, in old people, the overweight, the immigrants, the people of color. And we can't let this happen when we have ways to solve this in the 21st century. So just because many of you guys ask, what do doctors do differently about strokes? What leads to them being missed or not missed? For your information, because you've asked, viral illnesses can often cause dizziness and vestibular problems, as can certain drugs, obviously, medications and their side effects. We have vestibular migraines pop up a couple times a year in the ER, at least the one um, close to where I live. Benign um, uh, positional vertigo, is another kind of mimicker. But unfortunately, it's an ethos that patients are overreacting and over-exaggerating that might lead to things being missed more often than not. And that's what I want us to recognize that that is an unacceptable misdiagnosis. If you diagnose something else and it's delayed, that's one thing. But saying it's all in your head does not foster that, that healing that you need to make sure that diagnosis happened timely. Uh, when somebody comes in, and this, these are things you should tell your doctor, if you have a new headache along with dizziness, if you can't walk, if you have nystagmus, which the doctor should check, they should look for um, your eyes moving in stereotypical patterns with certain head motions. If those are abnormal, these increase the risk of a stroke, not just dizziness from the other things I mentioned, but a true stroke. That is when doctors then put patients into CT scanners to look for bleeding in the posterior circulation. However, CTs are also notoriously bad for picking up strokes in the areas where dizziness happens, especially in these young people that I'm talking about. And that's where there's a role for MRI or MRA, magnetic resonance imaging or angiography. And those are the more definitive tests for picking up these subtle strokes that can blossom into something horrible um, if they're not caught early. That's how doctors think. Doctors want to help patients. Doctors need to do a better job of facilitating and promoting that trust with patients. And I hope that you can ask these questions. Ask their plan. Ask what else is on their mind. Tell your doctor honestly and 
um, respectfully, if you're not comfortable, you're anxious about the plan. Be objective wherever possible. Diaries are very powerful. And don't over-explain. Instead, try to engage with your doctor if you feel like they're cutting you off. With these tips, I believe that you can help uncover your healing potential with a doctor's guidance. And I really appreciate all of your positive feedbacks. If you appreciate me coming in here after a long day in the operating room, I really appreciate it if you can hit that like button and share what you've learned with others. Remember that you have more power over your health than you've ever been told. And your support helps me do this more often for you. I will certainly think about that book. I appreciate all of your encouragement. I hope that you feel inspired to better advocate for yourself and share with others what you've learned.